Okay, ja, ja, muss ich Der Hund ist eine Ausrede. Well, thank you for the presentation, Francesca. That was good that you did it. Um, so I can skip also to introduce myself. And so we're having the medicamental debate today. Um, <coughs> I think we should possibly start with Francois, just to, um, for those who haven't heard the presentation of his project, to give a very brief introduction what this is going to be about. And then we qu can move on. I would be interested to speak about the state of um, Rausch, some kind of uh, ecstasy, some <coughs> state of the mind which is something that can be induced by different forms of either taking something into you or exposing yourself, exposing your body to some kind of outer influence. And <coughs> um, I think we're all experts on this topic in one way or another. And it would be very interesting to explore this from our different perspectives. And we can see how we can develop this from there into something maybe um <coughs> related to the project here. So I pass the microphone. Anyway, um, no, just uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the project we are trying to do here is, uh, w w so I came last year, uh, one year ago, but uh, uh, where the subject was talking about preservation, and uh, this word is very complex to use, uh, preservation. Uh, it, it, it has a lot of conservatism meaning uh, in the background, in the back. So it was interesting to perhaps uh, to to jump over the preservation to go inside in a in a in a, in a direction of reactivation. So we were thinking about uh, how we could reactivate, how we could uh, not only use a memory as a post effect, but also to reactivate the palpitating of the memory, even the the, the empathy with the memory. Uh, so our uh, an architectural pro architectural project could uh, vibes, uh, could talk about nostalgia, but as a weapon, when Douglas Coupland is talking about nostalgia as a weapon, not only as an effective, effective r uh, romanticism, remembering of the past, but also to re-include the practice of the monk, uh, the practice here uh, <coughs> using medicine, and at the same time, touching a kind of paganism, because uh, they use plants, they use toxic plants, they, they help people, but they use also many people as a guinea pig also to test the plant. So w they, I'm sure they abuse of this knowledge sometimes to create the fears around the mon monastery and at the same time through the fears to choose some people they could help to feel better. So in a way it was, it was a game. Just one question because I, I'll say, please. <coughs> you spoke about that yesterday and you said that what you're saying now is based on some kind of intuition that you had. It's not you didn't come here with a lot of research in your in your pocket, and you said this is this is how it was. No, I'm no, I'm not a specialist <coughs> of plants. So I could be myself your guinea pig mm. if you want to test some plants. Uh, but uh, <laughs> 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 that's what I mean. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. Abuse, abuse, please of me. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a kind of um, it's it was not exactly a provocation. It was more to uh, like, uh, like Umberto Eco uh, feeling uh, in uh, the name of Roses, uh, where we, we, wrap, we, we wrap too much easily this kind of uh, historical uh, uh, attitude where we recreate a perfect world with history. So it was interesting, uh, honestly, in by this intuition, to reintroduce a, p a Rabelais, a Rabelais practice. A kind of uh, uh, when Batkin is talking about Rabelais, it's a kind of uh, a, a dealing with paganism, a dealing <coughs> with a kind of monstrosity of grotesque. Uh, when Rabelais talk about the grotesque, so I was thinking about the situation how the monk could be grotesque by themselves, how they uh, not exactly religious, perfectly religious, perfectly pure in their face to God, but also with a very strange practice of alchemy, and how alchemy is a part of the knowledge, but also is creating, like biogenetic now, is creating a part of the fears, is uh, reactivating a part of the fear for themselves, for the people living around the monastery. So I was thinking how the monastery could be a kind of dangerous place, dangerous place because of, because of the, 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 the substance they create and the, and the people they need to test the substances. So finally, the intuition was to create a scenario 
And uh, it was very interesting that uh, s through this very small intuition, very basic in a way, to think that a, the, a monk could be satanic, is very, very s simple intuition. Uh, 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 and, uh, and after that, Barbara uh, went, uh, it's better if you talk about that, uh, Barbara went in, the, in Dubrovnik yeah. to, to see if the intuition was wrong or not. And it, it, seems, to be, it seems to be not entirely wrong. But so what you're suggesting is also that the monks were may making people ill by using them as guinea pigs. And at the same time, they would cure them either through the face to God or with some kind of medicine that they were developing here. It's clear that the protocol, the protocol of <coughs> alchemy, the protocol of testing, the protocol of abusing of people living around, and at the same time rescuing of, uh, uh, with the medicine they develop, uh, it's a kind of a game between death and life. And uh, 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 it's a discovering of the danger. Yeah. And it's also, it's also in the same time it's a discovering, but at the same time it's an abusement of the discovering, where you discover sometimes you play this discover to, 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 to have an authority, to develop a kind of authority. And we know how the uh, Umberto Eco talk about that. Uh, how they develop the authority also because of the fears they create through the knowledge. And how they keep the knowledge in the library of the uh, monastery, and they never, before Gutenberg, they never share the knowledge. But because then Barbara, she went on to do this research, and, and you got access to the to the forbidden library. Right. Well, it's it's, it's not um, it's the library is not forbidden, so it's publicly accessible. But um, but they're but they were you know perfectly um, sort of accommodating. But just to sort of um, I guess I'll start by putting this sort of into a historical context, right? And so just with respect to um, like how monastic medicine <coughs> was established, right, or how it came into being. Um, so uh, botany as, as a natural science did not exist, right? It was, botany was synonymous with medicine. And, um, and the foundation of, of herbal medicine was laid down by the Greeks. And so when you had um, the fall of, of Greco-Roman civilization and the rise of Christianity, um, you know, this period was characterized, you know, by death, destruction, and these manuscripts, these Greek manuscripts, were preserved um, in the monasteries. And through the generations, what you had, you had these monks uh, translating these manuscripts. But, but keep in mind that these monks were not exclusively just faithful copyists, okay? They added um, to these uh, medicinal prescriptions through their own <laughs> observations and their own experimentations, right? Um, so that's a, a popular misconception, right? That these were just passive scribes, right? And so, you know, initially the drug cabinet was very small, right? But eventually it grew and it became more elaborate. Um, and, and so, and another, of course, component um, in monastic medicine is, is that underlying all the empirical and scholastic herbal use um, is, is a strong spiritual base, right? So they treated, you know, the body and the soul in tandem, right? And, um, and this relationship, right, is that it's interesting because this relationship that guided the architecture of the monastery, right? So you've got, I mean, we're in the cloister now, so you have the pharmacy behind that door, like in that room. Um, and then if you just, the, when you go through the main entrance um, and to the right, there's a corridor. And uh, that's actually what we think could have been the monastic hospital, okay? Because um, there's a couple of uh, structural elements that suggest that use. Uh, first of all, there are windows, right, on one side of the wall, and they look out onto a garden. So the idea there was, you know, to give the, sick, a charming view, right, of the outside. And also, on the opposite wall, there are these portals or windows, and they go directly into the church, right? So, I mean, the idea there is, is that the sick, you know, they couldn't attend Mass, but <coughs> they could, you know, they could hear it, right? Um, so, during the Middle Ages, um, by the Middle Ages, you had um, European monasteries were equipped with a medicinal garden, a pharmacy, a pharmacist, and oftentimes a hospital, right? So, the, I mean, monasteries were really the only place that people, you know, could go to, right, um, when they were ill. Um, can I ask you one question? Yes, you sure can. Do you think you have any evidence that the monks were using substances <coughs> also on themselves in order to get to a state of ecstasy? <laughs> um, no, there is no, there is, also keep in mind is, is that, um, 
But with respect to sort of the inner workings or the daily workings of monasteries, that information is very difficult to, f to find, right? Because, um, you know, we have, there is documentation of um, the Republic of Dubrovnik, right, engaging um, or using poisons, right, you know, to sort of d do away with, um, you know, if, uh, public officials, right? And, you know, there is documentation with regards to the public, right, you know, doing away with neighbors. Um, but there is very little s documentation that we have, but there is some, right, that, um, that the monks used poisons, right? So the question is, the monks, def we know for sure that the monks manufactured poisons, yeah, well right? Did, uh, of course they did a lot of alcoholic uh, beverages, and in Belgium you have these monks, Trappist, uh, which are not mm -hmm. supposed to talk, they make the strongest beer, uh, in Belgium, I always wonder how that uh, fits together <laughs> to the obligation not to talk. Um, but so I'm interested, mm -hmm. in, you know, maybe in these times there are some other substances used, mm -hmm. and it would be interesting mm -hmm. also to hear from your perspective, Mark, um, how because you have been dealing with the state of ecstasy from a different perspective. They are freely induced by um, <coughs> by plants, but even though they also, you told me yesterday, they smoke a bit of ganja and uh, they're using tobacco, but mainly it's another technique and it would be very interesting to hear how they get to the state of the mind. Yeah, uh, okay, well, um, of course, uh, in your introduction it comes through already. Uh, in a way I have to play the, Diab uh, the Advocatus Diaboli because in the areas where I've been working in the Himalayas, uh, basically um, the people who are involved in medical acts, that is, the healers on the one hand and the patients on the other hand, and of course there's a third party always there, that is the supernaturals. And the patients don't take any drugs except the normal alcohol that people drink when they are together. The shamans, when they act, they take much more alcohol than the other people, but they usually do not get pissed completely. I just say completely. Heavily, yes, but not completely. <laughs> and, but I do not think that, although, I, I must say, there is a, the main point for them is, is not uh, a drug that they take, whatever, uh, the main point is healing through words. It's a concept that is very prominent. They heal by chanting. They heal by chanting myths. And these myths tell about stories, the, the original stories of how this or that disease came about, how this and that person died of it, and then the shaman sings, he, su he makes a kind of diagnosis, finds out to a certain degree what this person has. Sometimes he makes a mistake and then he changes his attitude. And he finds out which kind of mythological uh, story is fitting to the particular case. And then he starts singing. He calls his ancestors. He sings various songs about the different th objects that are needed for a, for a ritual and so forth. And then comes a story and the story is related to the story somehow of the a patient. And through this act, which lasts a whole night, sometimes two nights, sometimes even three nights, they heal. They integrate the patient into the mythological story and in the myth, it always comes out bad. And so the idea is the patient has to somehow become the mythical figure and then disentangle from this figure. That is the main po uh, active part of the patient. Otherwise, nothing. In terms now of, um, of ecstasy or whatever, there is certainly one drug that is all prevailing and of great importance and that is sleeplessness. Mm -hmm. They stay up for 
two days and nights, three days and nights, all of them. Of course, sometimes people fall asleep, even shamans fall asleep. Uh, there's a lovely article by Philippe Sagan, it's called The Dozing Shaman. Uh, I recommend this. Uh, so, uh, the, the drugs, in the way we think normally, you know, when we hear something about shamanism, is, in my opinion, not such an important thing in the Himalayan uh, healer's uh, work. But I think Christian has a completely different opinion about this. <laughs> So, <laughs> but I think you should just finish it because it's yeah. very important to get this right. Mm. So, but you talk about, um, you know, like deep personification, if you can say like this, that, that they become somebody else. So they're really changing their state of mind from, say, uh, you know, like a, a member of the community that they live in into a, sh a shaman who's taking possession of something and becoming something else. Yeah. So that's a very ecstatic state, isn't it? Or is it, would, would, you, yeah. would you not use that word for it? Um, well, it's um, beyond normal, I would say, yeah. And of course, in, in, the, in the course of a, of a seance, the shamans go into ecstatic uh, states, which don't last very long. That is very often in the middle of a particular um, uh, uh, place in, in the chant, in the narrative, that for instance a spirit has fallen uh, off uh, the, a bridge and then somehow he gets into this so much that the shaman himself falls down mm. on the floor and then has these uh, kind of uh, uh, movements that we all expect them to have. Yeah, uh, But then a, a minute later he's back again or he doesn't disappear completely, his mind is still there. He, in ecstasy, he still smokes his cigarette, yeah? The masters, the, the young ones, they can't do that. They are completely taken out. And who, who do they take, who takes them out? It's their ancestors, it's spirits. Healing is a spiritual, a religious act. And we have to consider this, yeah? Because I think uh, it's an important point also now, First of all, if we go into the earlier days, you know, in the medieval times, uh, I think it was had also very often some metaphysical uh, connotation, uh, the uh, medical activities. In these areas what, that we call shamanic, it is the rule. It's always faith healing or an unfaith healing, whatever, yeah? So that is a very important thing. And Medical activity is a, how should I say, a, a social communication act. Be it uh, profane or be it sacred or transcendental. And the tra when it is transcendental, it is always the communication between man and the supernatural world. Those who have caused the illnesses. There are no illnesses that are not caused by supernaturals. All of them are caused by them. And what is important is, and usually it is the patient who has made a mistake. He has tread on the supernatural. So he has to be appeased, and that's the job of the shaman. He has to find out who is the, this spiritual force, where is the force, and what did the patient do? That is part of the job. And then he, go, he makes a trip, the famous shamanic journey, and the shaman tries to find out that supernatural force, meets that force and says, look, you've taken the health away from my patient. Good so. He did this and that, or she did this and that, but I have something which is much more attractive for you, blood. And then the spirit thinks, oh, maybe good, and lets himself be enticed by the shaman to come back to the house, to the village, give back the stolen soul, which is the health, and instead gets an animal chopped. And that is the gift for the supernatural. So it's a deal. It's a communication act. And I think it might be interesting to look in terms of ethnobotany also, where in botanical uh, terms, 
the communication could be. Yeah, maybe this is something Christian just... Uh, we, we have the pleasure of having Christian Rech here, who is really like a world expert in um, <coughs> psychoactive uh, plants and mushrooms. And uh, it would be very interesting to hear his view upon shamanism from, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, somebody who is more into psychoactivity, if you can say okay. like that. Yeah, I, I can get into that easily. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, the well, thank you for introducing me, and um, I'm specialized on ethnopharmacology. That's um, a science which is ra really rare. Uh, nobody really understands what it is, uh, but we like five per people on the planet doing this. Uh, so we study uh, the uh, pharmacological effects in a cultural uh, perspective. And... Um, Somebody uh, said this name, drugs, uh, that sounds really terrible to me. <laughs> um, there is a lot of, of plants uh, on this planet which has been used and are used in shamanic uh, cultures until today. And um, most of these plants are uh, biologically active and uh, they can really change your consciousness. And uh, for maybe 10 minutes, maybe for 10 hours, uh, that really depends on what you've taken. So um, all these plants have their role in shamanic uh, societies and cultures. And um, I can just give you an example of what I really like. And uh, maybe you heard the word before, ayahuasca. That's very hard to get. It's very easy to get. Well, you have to tell me all about it. <laughs> it's all over the planet. Uh, even in Kathmandu, you can get it. Yeah, even in Kathmandu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not on Loput, maybe. I don't know. But um, if you want to uh, understand shamanism based on uh, the uh, use and knowledge of plants, then just go to Peru, that's uh, the safest country, and uh, you uh, went, uh, go to Pucallpa or Iquitos. Uh, there is even airports, and uh, you just tell the taxi driver, get me to the next Ayahuasquero. And uh, then uh, you in the hands of a shaman in 20 minutes. And uh, the uh, word ayahuasca is uh, from um, uh, a, a native language, uh, which is Quechua, and that means the vine of the soul, or the vine of the deceased, or the wine of the decent, or whatever. It is uh, the connection from your person uh, to the rest of the universe. There were some talks about the universe yesterday, but uh, uh, you should take ayahuasca and uh, look at it again. <laughs> because uh, it's, it's really difficult to talk about it. Uh, it's not really uh, uh, possible. I can tell you it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's healing, it's medicinal, it's um, shamanic, it's blah, 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 but uh, you don't know what I'm talking about. It's another, totally another state of consciousness. And uh, this is connected uh, to the plant world and uh, you're gonna see uh, uh, beautiful beings from nature, like uh, the trees are human beings uh, coming out of the tree and you can meet them and uh, you can talk to the trees, you can talk to the bushes and you can talk to the jaguar and the uh, uh, anaconda and all these uh, things. Uh, but uh, what is so amazing is that uh, everybody who uh, is uh, treated by an ayahuasquero has to drink the ayahuasca 
because otherwise you don't know anything. That's what they say. Uh, you only understand life and life forces and uh, you understand healing and uh, being in a good mood uh, if you take the plants. So these plants used f uh, for making ayahuasca, it's like two plants. It's one uh, is a vine. Uh, it's not wine, it's a vine. It's, uh, you know, it's a creeper kind of thing. And uh, the other is a bush. And uh, what uh, the uh, Native Americans discovered in ayahuasca is sensational because uh, these two plants have to be combined. Otherwise, there is no effect at all. Uh, uh, the one plant, the vine, contains uh, so-called uh, better uh, carbon lines, harmine and harmaline. And uh, the bush, uh, the leaves, uh, contain uh, what we call DMT. And, uh, well, some a smile, maybe you have taken DMT already. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the uh, molecule of uh, consciousness. And it's the molecule of enlightenment. I think so. It's a natural compound in our system. We all contain DMT, but uh, we're not using it so much. Um, it's, it's a national, uh, natural compound. You can find in many different plants and animals, and even in human beings. But uh, the uh, DMT is not uh, active orally. If you just swallow it, it doesn't do anything. It's uh, just uh, uh, metabolized uh, by uh, an enzyme that's called MAO, MAO, monoamino oxidase is uh, the full chemical name. And uh, this uh, is very important for us. We have to have it because uh, that's the reason why we can uh, eat cheese and not die. Cheese is really, is, is, is really dangerous. <laughs> it's very toxic. <laughs> to, to borrow the term of, of toxicity. No, uh, uh, there is uh, some, some, some compounds in, this, in, in cheese which is really dangerous, but um, the MAO um, breaks it down. Mm, no, 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 it, it just breaks it, breaks it down. And, um, metabolize it, or <coughs> so it has no effect. But you so, like these two substances, they work together in a special yes, way. Yes, only yeah. because uh, the uh, substances in the vine um, is uh, an MAO inhibitor. So if you take this vine, uh, the production of MAO in the body is canceled. So uh, then you can uh, drink DMT and uh, get them to ecstasy. It's but very you simple. You can also smoke it. And, and yes, you can also inhale it. Yeah. I, I, you can also take it rectally yeah. and uh, all, all kinds of. Uh, it's it's a very big topic. Maybe just move on so everybody can say something because I wanted to explore uh, also the relationship between uh, these states of the mind and music. Um, for instance, when you go to the Ayahuasca. Yes. Do you have any music there? Or is oh, it yeah. Music? That's the main thing. What kind of music is it? Uh, it's songs sung by the shaman. Yeah. And um, <coughs> I can give you an example if you want. Yes. Yes. Like this, it's, uh, it sounds, sounds terrible. Like no, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, uh, the main thing in healing is music, is songs, and uh, and that's what I mean by words, actually. Yes, words and, and music, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 and, and uh, no, there's no drums in, no, in South, South America, America. No. It's completely different. No, uh, they just take nature. It's yeah. more effective. Yeah. It's yeah. easier to achieve. Yeah. No, um, the songs are uh, con sorry, uh, connected to patterns. Yeah. 
and uh, these patterns are painted or uh, uh, woven into uh, industrial works and stuff. And um, these patterns you're going to see. If uh, I'm the shaman, I take ayahuasca. You, my patient, you also take ayahuasca. I see you. I see there is uh, patterns on your body all over. But in some part, uh, the patterns are disturbed distorted and so then I sing these song lines and uh, to uh, give back harmony to the body because it's uh, it's a reflecting point of sound and song and so the healing process is a singing actually it's happening yeah so it's, it's, it's yes away. yeah it's yeah. only singing they yeah. ju don't do anything uh, but uh, they uh, say, and this is maybe um, uh, important, no ayahuasquero tells himself a shaman. Uh -huh. The shaman is the plants, the two plants of ayahuasca. Uh -huh. And everything is done by these plants. And these plants are just uh, sacred for anybody and for shamans. They are the uh, most valuable tool in understanding um, uh, illnesses and yeah. so on. Boris, um, maybe do you have something to say about the relationship between music and this ecstatic state of the mind? Maybe something em empiric. Yes. Um, uh, I used to be a, a, a rock singer. And uh, I, I still sing a lot, and it's a, yeah, it's a purest <coughs> pleasure. Uh, when you go on stage, you mm, you can easily get some vibration from the audience, but also from entire contextual situation, which somehow separates you. So you you immediately uh, enjoy some kind of really autonomous experience which then you can deli deliver somehow to the back to the audience so I think it's I, I believe that uh, also when we speak about uh, uh, those ac activation uh, elements like plants or whatever it just stimulates the potentials which you already have in the body so it's a re result of, of the relation of, of uh, the existing potential and a stimu stimulation factor. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a chemical or if it's a vibration, if it's physical, because also also music has a, of course, haptic aspect. Yeah, but Christian is saying that it's a very specific result of the ayahuasca that brings you to this very specific state of the mind. I think it's, but, but, but you, you have it in your body, those, you know. Yeah, but you don't get to it unless you have Yes, but but I, I think there there are different cultures and different ways how to get uh, knowledge or enlightenment. So it should be massage, or, or it should be you know singing, just a pu pure singing, or or ju it's just even breathing. <coughs> so I think it's a uh, we have no other chance just to to work with what what we what we have. It's a body. So yeah, but also then <coughs> music um, can be specific too. I'm, I'm just interested in the question if it's a specific thing or something more general that you know you just need some kind of trigger or whatever it is. Is it some something you hear, something you see, something you take into you in, in one way or another? Or is it, is it like is there really something beyond just the simple trigger mechanism? Is there something that is very specific and allows you to access some kind of other world if you want that you maybe can only get access to if you have a lot of training if you are like <coughs> for instance you went you go <coughs> to a sh shamanic uh, uh, practice you become a shaman you can do this or you can get access to special substances these kind of things the specific uh, how do you say specificity of it <laughs> this is a, a hard word um, <coughs> I, I can only say from my own personal experience um, for me uh, ketamine was the thing that was the most opening up thing I've ever done. And it's not something I want to do necessarily again. It's not something I want to uh, 
well, I, I want to do a given. I'm not, I'm not craving for it. It's just something I'm very happy I did. It really changed my life. <coughs> I have seen something that I cannot achieve with music, I cannot achieve with anything else I've ever tried. But it's, it's also, like you say, inexplicable. You cannot find words for it. But as a point of reference for my own life, it's very, very important. I can only mm -hmm. recommend for people who are experimental enough to try to explore <coughs> what can be experienced in a lifetime to go this way. And maybe ayahuasca, I've never tried it, but I would love to uh, experience would this too. Love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But David, tell us about your point of view on these things. Well, I'm wondering, I'm wondering how to look onto that. But uh, maybe I'm really interested in the, in the social implications of it, of like trance as a socially accepted state of mind that has also a function in uh, transcending and also transcending maybe uh, a political circumstance like can trans be for example a form of resistance and i think this is it's definitely a mimetic technique as well i mean there's there's substances that favor but uh, there is certain voodoo techniques that also bring you in a state of, of trance that uh, for example, when people are familiar with the work of Jean Rouge, Le Maître Fou, it's a very interesting subject on, on the Nigerian cult of the Hauka, which uh, get in touch with ancestors and embody as a form of like mimetic resistance, the ancestors. So they're being possessed, but they're actually being possessed by the colonizers. And this has been seen by the colonial power as a form of unacceptable critique, like even Jean Rouge's film was basically forbidden to be screened in the 60s. And this was basically, I think, a kind of social phenomenon that goes as, uh, that comes, that stems actually from a, from, a, from a form of collective trance that is, I don't know how to say that, also something like Blutrausch, like you get into a state of mind that just takes over. Can I just say one word? Um, so one should certainly include dance. Yeah. I mean, in the voodoo stuff, uh, yeah, have you seen the Mayadaran material? Yeah. Uh, fantastic, Same. yeah? Uh, and it's all dance. There's no drug involved, yeah. none. But they get into this uh, state, uh, altered state, if one may say so. Yeah. This, is this was also, also my point, because also you have this the dervish, uh, tradition and and so, so somehow the the body in if you use something external or if you do it yourself uh, produces certain uh, chemo physical uh, processes which which should bring you to yeah we we can say trans or uh, ecstasy or but uh, i i think it's uh, the these words like ecstasy or trans they they describe the somehow the a level of of uh, uh, your state, particular state of your mind and, and, and the body, which means that it's we refer to the spectra. So it might be that if you if you hear the song in the radio from your childhood, you have just uh, you know maybe two percent of this trance, and then maybe if you are a, a, a master in in Mongolian throat singing, you get maybe eighty percent. So it's a I. I don't know if, if it is possible uh, to generalize where the ecstasy starts or where the trance starts. It's impossible. It, uh, it's, it's actually it's impossible. Uh, we are also kind of, of course, there is the effect of the substance on your consciousness, but also there is the, the pre effect on your consciousness produced by your body, produced by this desirable machine. When the rest about ours, we are a machine producing dough. So when I'm eating fugu, we talked about fugu last night. When I'm eating fugu first, I will start to stress. So my body is producing the cortisol, uh, which is the, 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 the chemical aspect of the stress. And after I, I eat the fugu, I have the, the pleasure of the flesh of the fugu. So um, my body is producing the dopamine, naturally. And, uh, uh, and after I have the, 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 the effect of the substance itself, or the toxicity of the fish, uh, so there is, there is a pre-consciousness effect produced by the body. And now this n the n neurobiology, the neuroscience, is discovering that we could perhaps caress the, produce, the product and the substance produced by the body itself. So it's interesting how a placebo, uh, as how the placebo substances could create a psycho effect on yourself.
without any toxicity in the substance itself. So how the psycho effects is also very important in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a <coughs> protocolizing a narration, protocolizing a scenario. It's not only the, the quality of the state you could create by this going this parallel universe. It's also how you deal yourself, how you redeal yourself with how you renegotiate this production of melatonin, this production of dopamine. And uh, in the sense of Antonin Artaud, uh, it's uh, when the monk was playing this, uh, uh, this game uh, with, uh, with plants, they were considering plants with a soul. The plants are not totally exterior from themselves. The plants are a part of themselves. And it, it's, it's very interesting how in the Middle Age, uh, uh, many times, there's many reports about that, uh, uh, there was people were doing prosecution against the plant. If a tree is falling down... Mandrake. 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 Yeah. Mandrake. 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 If, 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 if a tree is falling down on somebody, yeah. the tree, as, as, a, as a prosecution, injustice, to, to understand the guiltiness of the trees. So it was very interesting how the trees, the plants, was carrying also a kind of guiltiness. Yeah. And there was no separation between, uh, like uh, Rabelais, uh, between what you absorb and your own body. It's like a, a body without organ. It's this kind of, all the universe is a part of you. And uh, in a sense of, uh, of Arto, body without organ is something where the, 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 the modern medicine didn't separate all your organ or your, all your organi organism inside a functional using. It's, it's considered as a flux. It's considered as a dynamic flux uh, from outside to inside. And in the sense, to caress. That's why I think the psycho effect is very important in the project we're doing here. It's not only the plant as a post effect. It's how we could understand that the, the negotiation with the fears, the negotiation with the fears and the narration around the fears is producing product by your own body before to absorb the product itself. So you want to create some kind of... Um, <coughs> like a very special form of tourism. <laughs> it's like a fear tourism. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps. It's not exactly... It's more... It's not a kind of dealing with a kind of animality. It's, it's, it's uh, the animality in yourself, how you negotiate with this animality, and this animality produces substance. The sensation of the animal in, front, in, in yourself is producing by the body, by this de desirable machine, I, and you could caress the substance produced by the body. It's clear when you are making love, the dopamine produced by the body is pure pleasure. It's not coming from the love, it's coming from the chemical effect as a, uh, as a collateral effect of the love. It's also interesting how it stops oh. abruptly. <laughs> uh, always people speak about when it's there, but the moment when it's finished, it's also very, it's just poof. And you have to stop. I always think this the is little death, the yeah. little death, yeah. yes, is important yeah. also. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, have a, I have a question to you. Um, yeah, uh, that is, um, wh when you um, talk about the, I mean, you were talking mainly about uh, South America right now, and there, uh, my question is, uh, is only the shaman taking? The drug, or is the patient everybody. Everybody. everybody? everybody. So also the other people present. Yes. Not Every, the patient. Everybody. So everyone is a patient yes. in a way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, healing is not yeah. Uh, yeah. a pro, uh, thing, a single thing. It's it's a process. Yeah, but one person is ill and the others are not. Uh, yeah, that but, they know. Uh, but, uh, or not. <laughs> uh, they have great experiences, yeah, and yeah. Uh, these experiences are healing. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in this healing is not uh, what we learned that a, a doctor is yeah. giving you some medicine. The healing mm -hmm. is a whole process uh, to integrate uh, your personality into uh, the realm of nature. The cosmic balance or something, yes. yeah. Mm. But uh, I mean, I think one should not f forget this point uh, that in some of the shamanic practices, not there perhaps, but in other areas where they do take certain kinds of drugs, it's not the patient who gets the no. stuff, yeah? No, no, it's, the sh it's the healer, the doctor takes the drugs, yeah? <laughs> I mean, one has to consider that, yeah? Mm? 
Yeah, go to your doctor and ask for some uh, uh, diagnosis. Then he uh, or she will take a dose of LSD and <laughs> look at you. And you are better, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe we can come back to this idea of, uh, or not come back, but explore the idea a little bit of, of also the entertainment aspect that is in there. Uh, you've been speaking about the ayahuasca, we enjoy to have a glass of wine in the evening. There are so many different ways how we can stimulate our body in a very positive way. Um, <coughs> this is something which seems to me to be totally unexplored, because the difference between having a glass of white wine and say, uh, smoke a joint or something to have uh, uh <coughs> two substances that maybe um, most people have explored is quite dramatic. Then if you go on to some other substances and to the influence of music, to the influence of love, to the influence of dancing, all these kind of things, they're very, very different. In my feeling, um, there must be much more that we haven't really experienced, that we haven't really worked on, something that can be still out there there. Everything is here. We have everything. I and don't think so. I, th I read one book, uh, which you probably also read by Gordon Rossen, which is called Soma, yeah. and we don't have the Soma. Um, this is what... Yeah, but that's a misconception. Well, let's <laughs> talk about uh, it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but you think it's all there, okay, but then you have to be a specialist to go there and there. It is not part of us. We don't, we have a very limited range of things that we're really doing. You well, say it's but available? But, uh, but you're the best example. You know Ketamine. I mean, how many of you know Ketamine? <laughs> the same guy always. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's great, isn't it? And it's uh, impossible to describe. And there's no need to describe. But if you know somebody who kn knows it, uh, then you can say, yeah, it's great. And then you understand. Perfect. But uh, it's, it's uh, uh, difficult to uh, talk about it. And uh, I realized uh, we are talking about ecstasy and trance. Uh, do you really think that's uh, the same thing? No, I don't think so. I think there's very different uh, uh, yeah, every, things that you can every, uh, come to. Every non-pharmacological technique and every pharmacological technique is unique. It's one thing. Plus, it's, it's a result of your own personality, so it's not only unique in the, in the way, but also no, it's unique, it's unique in the person. With you, yes, yeah. of course. So it gives a multitude of, of possibilities which are completely yeah, immense. Yeah. But, but uh, using the term ecstasy, uh, we have to follow down the meaning of the word to the ancient Greeks. Ecstatic means to be out of your body temporarily. Yeah. And a trance is uh, something very different. And um, there is many uh, people using the word trance uh, nowadays, and uh, there is no definition at all. I mean, there's even uh, some kind of music called psychedelic trance, uh, and it's like boom, 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 mm. boom uh, very simple stuff. Mm. Yeah. But um, that has nothing to do with ecstasy. You, you may, may, maybe we, we, we should get, get back to, no, no, let's not forget this question about pleasure. Yeah? I think that is important uh, on the level both for the person, for in the individual, but in many of these shamanic uh, activities or sh shamanic uh, seances or happenings or whatever mm -hmm. you may call them, uh, transactions or whatever, uh, gatherings, yeah? uh, the, there is, first of all, Perhaps there is a pleasure or the unpleasure. I mean, sh some shamans, when they go, when they are inhabited by a, a spirit, by their mm. ancestor, they go in pain. Yeah. They, they wriggle around on the body in pain, yeah? So maybe that's a pleasure too. I don't know. But it's, it's certainly <laughs> ecstasis, yeah? Uh, certainly. But the point is, you have this on the individual side and you have it also on the collective side. And I think the collective side is really interesting also. And because perhaps the being together, going through an experience over a night and people come there from the next house and from the other, even from other villages to have a good entertainment. Something is happening. They have no movies. So they go to the shaman's event. 
And so it is a collective event, and that perhaps has, at least on a psychological level, some e enormous effect for the healing of the person who is ill. Because it means he or she is taken care of, and not only by the shaman, but by the traditional songs and chants they are singing. Interesting aspect also is a kind of the, the, the idea of simultaneity. So you could escape from this from the system to another system immediately with an immediate effect. A little bit. Like, it was the, 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 the last lectures of Philippe Cadic in France. In France, the last lecture was: if you think this word bad, you need to see some others. And many times the architect use uh, the word you need to invent some others and uh, to, to reject the simultaneity to another time. And it's very interesting this, uh, this kind of simultaneity of like, like Thomas More, what the utopia of Thomas More. It's an island in the real time of the English monarchy talking of, a, of another social protocol, but not projecting the futures, not, uh, not with a kind of religious, uh, religious uh, uh, propaganda of the futures. It's accessible immediately. And this kind of, uh, of accessibility for drugs, but uh, also in the utopia sense, how you could transfer it yourself in another world, and of course coming back from this other world to modify this perception of the reality. And it's, uh, 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 what I was going to say is, uh, in, in the utopian sense of Thomas More, it's produced it's produce this kind of drugs. It's produced uh, our uh, narrative aspect, political and narrative aspect of Thomas More, produced simultaneously exactly the, the desire to transform the reality because the story is not projected to futures. The story is exactly in the same time of the people living and reading the story. And uh, so I think it's created, it's a kind of shaman. Uh, we could consider Thomas More as a shaman, but using the drugs of literature, of novel, to produce the simultaneous effect of transformation. So drugs is, are not only linked to the substance, but also to the scenario you are writing to justify you could transfer it yourself in something else, in somewhere else, to modify and to force the, modi the, the reality to modify. To be an architect, honestly, we have incredibly tooling to do that. Incredible, uh, we have incredible uh, tool to, to play this game of real simultaneous time where we could include in the reality something which is a subjectivation. Uh, okay, so then I have a question, you know. Uh, I, so, somehow I'm, I st still have a garden on, on, on my mind, you know, because it's a, uh, one of the reasons why we are here is a very practical reason to, to put different inputs to existing context or growing context. And uh, so, uh, in the, in the original context of the of the monastery, the garden was not separated from the hospital. It was some kind of a uh, synchronicity between and you know both sided uh, flow. And but now we have a garden which is separated from the hospital because we don't have a hospital. And we are si we are now speaking about many possibilities of of uh, mm, and potentials which which we have so close to us now. You know to have the garden where all of those. Uh, plants with fabulous, possible fabulous function will be. So uh, how, how uh, to go one step further? <laughs> how, how to, uh, I mean, I, I, I understand the, 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 the sense of the garden as, 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 as far as I understand the, the, the sense of botanical garden in, in the center of metropolis. But uh, might be we have a chance to go one, one, one step further with, you know, with the garden. What do you think? Uh, just it, it's, it's a protocol. It's a, we have to protocolize. First, we have to develop the machine. Now we have to, to, we have to do the machine. We have to do the machine, and we have to protocolize the collateral effect. It could be medical, medical collateral, phytotherapy. I don't know. It could be also test on yourself as a passion. It could be so. I think the, 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 the wide uh, uh, usefulness of the, it's a system. It's a system of reintroducing plants, but we don't, we not achieve, we, I don't want to achieve the, the function of, the, of this transformation. So I think we have to invite, with Francesa, we have to invite perhaps not only artists, but botanists, research, sure. etc., to, to go further in the, to, first is to develop the machine. 
the desirable machine and after to go further to, to, to test many protocol of instrumentalization of this possibility. Of so, so you think that, that the kind of a, a schedule is to to create the potential and then to test different different uh, uh, aspects of the potential on site. Okay. Okay. the preparation of the drugs and the, um, all the paraphernalia that people use to ingest the drugs. And I think that's a, that's a very important process of the whole, um, you're talking about taking various substances but not how you ingest them. And I think that's one of the very interesting uh, new parts that Francois has brought to the project are these incredible distillation machines and uh, you were showing them to Karsten and I last night and. I thought, you know, I think everybody else here should actually also see these. But I mean, how do you? Don't you think that that's a very interesting part of the project? The fact that he's designed these instruments for consumption just for, just for, just for, for precision, not just for precision. Teaser. We didn't choose one technique, so we choose say, the sublimation the, to produce gas uh, from from a substance. We we use also dryer. We use also uh, 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 d uh, vacuum distillation. We use also a kind of uh, extracting solid. So now we didn't choose. We try to open the machine to be as uh, open possibility, uh, as a very open wide possibility to define the protocol after. So as you said, to, to, it's not to make an exclusive transformation. Uh, it's more to, to, to open the resource and open the potential, as you said, open the potential of transformation. So that's why the machine needs to be, the, the protocol of the machine of transformation needs to be as wide as possible now, with a very high technicity. And of course, that's something I don't know because I'm, I'm not, I'm just, like I said, a guinea pig of the experiment. Uh, uh, it's, we have to learn about concentration and deconcentration. What is, the, what is the degree of concentration and what we, how we could uh, deconcentrate the substance, where it became a danger, a real danger, and where it became just a placebo, just a psycho effect, and when is our, it's a real effect. Like the fugu, we talk about you eat fugu without any effect. So I don't know if it's a good cooker. I, I don't know if when you are a good cooker, you need to let yeah, no, a kind of toxicity. Bad. You need to let a part of toxicity. And when you are a very good cooker, you need to push away the toxicity. So I don't know where, what is a good cooker of fugu? Is to put away everything? Or, or if it's to let a little part of toxicity you, you feel when you eat the fugu? So this kind of uh, research is very interesting. Interpretation and also the psycho effect directly coming from the preparation. So the machine, the machine is a Bachelor machine in the sense of Duchamp. In the same time, it's producing a very rigorous scientific transformation but also the machine is pretending to do something she's not doing. Yeah, but first, I <coughs> just to come back to this, we don't, the machine is uh, an extra, no? It's not the raison d'etre. The machine is, it works without the machine. There's the, the, the body which, which works completely on its own. You can, some of these plants you can just smell, you know, like you, you don't need the machine. The machine is just a, a level of sophistication. Like the whole project is a level of sophistication. So it's, Aeration. yeah, it's, it's creating a new um, way of how this whole topic can be approached and what kind of new tourism it can produce. But Baba, I wanted to know how many plants are we really talking about? What, what is the numbers? We're talking a few hundred plants. So there are lists of three or four hundred plants that are not only native to the Mediterranean, but um, came from uh, the Middle East, Arabia, Southeast Asia, East Africa. Um, but just a comment on um, Francesca's point and the drug paraphernalia that's involved. Um, but also, there was there was not only ritual. I'm speaking, you know, with the monks and the monasteries here. But there was not only ritual involved in um, the administration of medicine, but there was intense ritual with respect to um, the preparation of medicine. Because these recipes involved, in some cases, over 70 like distinct plants, four ingredient formula that was given to um, individuals who couldn't afford right, a more elaborate formula. right, and. Um, and that's another interesting thing because 
these manuscripts in the monastery actually document what uh, families, like from, from the nobility, right, on the island of Lopud including, right, um, what they purchased, right, and everything was purchased on credit, right, and so, y so you can look down and historically follow, like, you know, uh, the families of nobility and so what, what they were able to purchase and when and, and uh, which is also, you know, an historical curiosity. So, so again, so like the technical skill was astonishing, right? And the, the, um, the elaborate medicines, right, that were concocted were just, you know, I mean, it was incredibly, incredibly time consuming, right? So there was a lot of ritual. And you can find these recipes again and we can, we can you recreate You can reproduce that. them, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if, if you, you know, if you've got access to parts of mummies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should have a cook here in the garden. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, that is the point. Uh, once one, right? Yeah. One thing is the exper exper experiential side of it. Yeah. But also, uh, maybe uh, one could think think of uh, uh, um, a taxonomical side of it, because there are there used to be gardens, like for instance the garden of Konrad Gessner in Zurich, um, that was not for. I mean, it was there in order to be used, but also it was there to show people what f type of plants belong to each other or are related to each other. And as, as a matter of fact, in the 60s, when the uh, in anthropology became interested in ethnobotany, it was mainly uh, for taxonomical reasons, that is, how to classify out the universe. Yeah? So it's, it was a completely intellectual matter and not an experiential one. But I think this is also an interesting part of it. Yeah. Were they also breeding at this time? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, breeding plants? Yes. Uh, no, no, not to like no, varieties. Not like, so deliberate. Yeah. No, um, not to my knowledge. I mean, yeah. I haven't it sort yeah. of encountered any of that. Okay. But maybe you should move on to questions from the public or how's the time schedule? I don't know. I yes. Okay, go on. To Barbara, actually. Um, I mean, d the, the location of Dubrovnik on the Adriatic Sea is a very strategic one between Asia and Venice and that trade of the Silk Road. And so there must have been a tremendous amount of knowledge. I mean, Marco Polo was born and left Korchula, started his voyages from Korchula. So there is this link to Asia, and I'm very familiar with Tibetan medicine, and I'm very interested in, in the alternative remedies that the Chinese and the Tibetans have developed over centuries, and their incredible wealth of knowledge. And is there any evidence of that manifesting itself in the documents so far that you've come up with? There is, actually. So there, um, it's still relatively ambiguous, but there are um, recipes that are entitled um, Balsams of the Orient. Right, so there are geographical um, indications that um, a lot of these, you know, the plants and potentially the actual recipes, right, came from uh, Southeast Asia. So there is, we do have preliminary evidence of that, yes. So I'm just hoping to get more detail. Yeah, yeah, that as well. So because with these, I mean, th they were, you know, they were relatively comprehensive, right? So the structure is you'd have you know, the, the plants um, for each recipe, but then also a detailed um, outline of how to administer the medicine, right? And how to store it, because, you know, some medicines were, were to be stored in clay versus tin versus glass, right? And all of that is included, right? So a recipe didn't exist without any, with, without any of that information. Talk about uh, a kind of uh, uh, causality and dependency is a bit strange uh, because there is a, a kind of illness of the rats. I think I talked last year about that, but it's interesting to repeat all the time the same thing as a comics of repetition. It's, a, it's a something that is we discover a kind of illness of the rat which became totally ecstatic in front of the cats. And the rat became to dance in front of the cat as to f forgot that the, rat, the, uh, the cat could eat him. And of course, the cat 
use as dancing party to eat the rat. And we discovered, so uh, it, it was very strange. So we were thinking that the rats was eating some kind of strange substances to, to avoid the fears or to disinhibit the fears. And finally, we discovered the neuroscience, discovered that it's a little worm, it's a, the Toxoplasma gondii. It's and called tree worm in The Toxoplasma yeah. gondii, the only way yeah. for the Toxoplasma gondii to, to survive, to reproduce itself, is to go in the stomach of the cats. And the only way to go in the stomach of the cat is to go first in the brain of the, of the rat to disinhibate the fears of the rat inside the cortex of the rat. And for that, so the cat is a rat and the Toxoplasma gondii, the worm, could reproduce itself by this pathway in the stomach of the cat. So it's very interesting how the, 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 the ecstatic, what we thought about the ecstatic dancing of the rat was produced by another animal, by a, by a causality and dependencies, which is coming not from the desire of the rats, of the cats, of the rats, mm -hmm. to try to di discover the pleasure, but perhaps it produces a dopamine effect during So you want to have that uh, here too as an experiment? That would be very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> I don't know. I we could, we could be <laughs> ourselves the cat and the rat on the, on the worm at the same time, simultaneously, which yes. is perhaps the most interesting uh, part of the, of the story. So to play the three in the three times the same story. But to, just to, to rediscover what is behind. What is behind, there is always a worm behind the pleasure of the ecstatic dancing in front of the cat. So to discover the, the worm and the, the, the reason of the alienation, go in your cortex and finally forcing you to disinhibit your dancing in front of the fears. I love this. So when it comes to psychoactive substances, maybe the worm is, <coughs> is, is more like a mechanics yeah. of entertainment. We've been using that word before. But we have a strong motivation to do things or not to do things in dependence on <coughs> how much entertainment or value it gives us, entertainment value if you want to call it like this. is not the right term maybe. But you know what I mean. And <coughs> this structure, which is possibly already there, could then be exploited and brought to some much further levels than what it was originally meant to be for. It's just, it's, but it's, it's a similar thing. It's like a worm. It's like a kind of inner thing. It's like a dictator you have inside, something that triggers you. You think you have control of it. No, there's something else that makes you go. But you can take over control if you go then for the drug side. I don't like the word so much, but if you use certain substances that help you to overcome <coughs> the pure mechanic side of it and then finally find a little degree of freedom into there. So the, the rat had to be killed because it's like the thing, but at least it had the moment of ecstasy and probably it was also committing suicide. May I ask a question to more or less everyone on the panel? We have been talking about, we've been listening to you uh, about chemistry and effects and how to grow the plants, etc. But what you have not talked about is um, how do the places look like where you actually throw these things? Because it's, I think it's one of the most primitive ways to, to go to a party and throw acid and then experience something. But um, Christian might know that probably much better than I do. For example, when you go to the um, Brazilian cults, Macumba and Candomblé, you have to, you have to earn your way to the so-called terreiro, where they take, uh, where the ceremony is taking place. And um, you have to have a certain age, you have to have learned by the Pai dos Santos, Mai dos Santos, that are more or less the priests, which is not the right expression, but anyway. So you have to, to go through a ritual to take part of the real ritual and that takes place in a, in a very closed s uh, sacred place so I, my question would be what do these tejero like places of the shamans look like and what is the um, ayubashkeros place look like and then i would like ask francois what is his terero going to look like because you can't just make the production site in my opinion and have the distilleries and everything, and then leave the people to the outside world with the drug. Well, uh, the ayahuasqueros uh, place is nature. It's the rainforest. It's very simple. You can uh, do uh, ayahuasca wherever you want, but uh, it's especially done in full moon nights and um, in nature. 
and uh, the um, um, soundtrack of nature is uh, as well as um, the songs of essential uh, quality. <coughs> but it's nature. Uh, there's uh, no garden, nothing. There is absolute just nature. You can uh, sit on the river bed and you can sit on a, a special place wherever. <coughs> but uh, you also have gardens and uh, the shamans uh, do garden these plants that they need for their work. Can I interject? <coughs> I have uh, two thoughts after listening so far today. There's uh, two books that I'd like to uh, include into the reading, the reading list for everybody. There's one book called Stone Age Soundtracks by a guy called Paul Devereaux, who's an yeah. audio archaeologist. And he's uh, visited these uh, stone circles and other kind of crypts, or I don't know what you want to call them. And I think it relates to this uh, singing or... Uh, a soundtrack because yeah. they, it, he's uh, proven or experimented within these spaces that actually you uh, you know there's standing waves there and through various types of singing and yeah. so on and so forth that this, this can actually assist and induce uh, these types of uh, I don't know, states uh, and so obviously going back to these ancient environments that that these spaces were set up to to uh, assist these, uh, 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 the way to get to these states, basically. Uh, so that's a good one uh, for the reading list. And a, a second book would be this uh, Sadie Plant's Writing on Drugs, which basically archives or uh, l lists and proves that most common uh, successful uh, pieces of literature and novels and so on and so forth that we've probably all read or are very familiar with were all written by people on various types of drugs. Uh, so I recommend anybody to read Writing on Drugs by I Sadie I Plant. I can recommend it too. Uh, uh, Paul Devereaux is a very close friend of mine. Okay, Thank top. Thank you, the first person I ever met who knew uh, his yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> you should have a pint with him if you get to England or whatever. Yeah, He's a good yeah. guy and he likes a beer. <laughs> yeah. Different to your books. You just said yeah, they were coming out in the 8th edition, right? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, he's top. He should be here, actually. What? He, I mean, I, I'm thinking now he should be here on this panel. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it would be lovely. We should have got him yeah. down as well yeah. next time, maybe. And Sadie Plant would probably be very good as well. Uh, but but uh, I can uh, recommend another book for your list, uh, Plants of the Gods. Okay, some, some people know it. Okay. It's uh, written by Albert Hoffman and uh, Richard Schultes. And uh, it, it, just the title is so perfect. Obvious. It's uh, it's the best title of a book I know, Plants of the Gods. But, but you, uh, when when Schultes uh, uh, proposed this title to the publisher, they said, no, 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 that's too pagan. It has to be Plants of God. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 this is not right. No, you didn't get it right. <laughs> so plants of the gods, and uh, that includes goddesses as well. Uh, I would, add, no, I would like to add one word to you, of course. Uh, uh, but there's also the, um, the book of Edelman, Substance of Consciousness, yeah. which is only the, uh, the guy who received the Nobel Prize in the 70s. It's uh, all, all about how the body is producing uh, the drugs and how we are, how we sometimes could caress our own production. Yes. We, we could force, we could force, the I, I have the pleasure to, to talk to you. I could, f I could force myself to feel the dopamine in my, in my blood. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. We could feel it, really. And, uh, so, about the ceremony, I think it's very important this kind of the right distances to the plant, uh, like kind of Levi Strauss attitude. We have uh, the project tried to to articulate the good distances, not so not so accessible, not too much far away. So that's why we try to make small garden, and you you access to the garden through a promenade. Uh, you need to make an effort to go to the garden. If there is a gradation of toxicity in the garden, so you could approach the danger. 
with a kind a protocol, a ceremony. It was very important to integrate. So it's not to, to take the plants from the garden and to eat it. So you have to, to accept the instruction, to, to a little bit like that, the instruction between a laboratory and between a, a cooking production. And it, it, it's very important to, to don, not to produce something where you banalize, I don't know the name in English, uh, banalize, you get this kind of anoblishment is interesting. So the, the plants are diamond. So we consider that as a restricted area. So it's like a laboratory where the plants are inside a restricted area, preserved and protected area, not to protect the plant, but to protect the people against the plants. <laughs> and, and, and something is interesting. So you, you, give, a, you give a status. To the, to the ceremony, you give a status to the plant, uh, something, uh, a psycho status. So you need to have this access and a little bit to take care. You need to take care about the accessibility. And uh, in this ceremony, to rediscover uh, slowly the animality in you, the, the, to redeal or renegotiate uh, with the animality, but with a kind of protocol very sophisticated. Uh, I love this uh, ceremony uh, idea, of course. Any questions? <coughs> yeah, I have a, a question for, for Christian um, about this um, this little like a, a sound example you gave us from from the Ayahuasqueros. Is there um, is there a big um, um, idea of repetition in that that you you're repeating this pattern over and over again? The, the pattern you're you're seeing on on the um, on the participating person in in the in in the um, uh, in the situation, or is it is it uh, changing highly that that you have like different um, there, uh, shapes the coming? The ritual is really very simple. The ritual is just uh, always the same. Just drink it. That's all. There's no paraphernalia, nothing, and uh, there is no um, concept others then it works for four hours and it works on you and that's it but it's, it's it's absolutely yeah. totally so, so the, the chanting this is it, is it kind of like a looped um a thing that's going on or is it no like no, no no that uh, uh, the, the the chanting uh, depends on uh, the um, things you see on people so you see different things yes you you, you see patterns on on the on the uh, patient's uh, body and According to these patterns, you can sing the song. It's like notation, and it's coming back to its. You know, like there's a kind of like a repetition in it that, like after, like say, like uh, hav having sung, sung all the patterns, you you would go back to the yeah. start, or, or you um, um, not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. Uh -huh. There is a high freedom in the whole thing, and uh, you can do everything. You can even use some rock music or. Psychedelic trance music or whatever. Yeah, um. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, there is some songs uh, that you can hear again in another session because it's like the opening song for the session. Uh, but, uh, but it's not looping. I think that's that's very interesting. Like from like a, a Western perspective, like you have this always this idea of um, um, that music that puts you into a, another state, like has to be like. Repeated and, and has like a, um, a you know a str a like work. I mean Mark is also like what interests me like from your side like the, the the shamanistic drum like which is kind of like giving this this rhythm and, and this like repetition and 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 what what you're saying Christian is uh, that it's, it can be like much more abstract what the, what this sound element or in 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 this uh, yeah. uh, in the session this means. Yeah. When in my in the tradition that I have studied uh, in, in Nepal. The mountains um, is uh, there is uh, an enormous amount of repetition, uh, both in terms of text, text uh, a story, say the narrative of a story, uh, goes on in a very minimalistic way. You have yeah, you have uh, a line which is divided into two halves. In the first half, you say, uh, say five six words. And in the second half, you say five, six words, five of them are the same, and one is different. And so it goes on in the next. So it's a minimalistic progression. yeah. And the same is the case with the, the, the pattern of the drumming 
and the same is with the music that they sing. So actually what you have is a very extremely limited form and an extremely rich text, textual composition altogether. They have more than the Ilias in their brains. Yeah? So that is, formally speaking, the, the, the point there. Yeah. It, it, there is also another thing, like wh when you go through the experience of, of Mongolian throat singing, it has nothing to do with, with the repetition. It's only how deep is, is the, the voice, where it comes from, and, and how robust it, it is. So it, it uh, really uh, makes uh, kind of a, a no really a material vi vibration in your body which goes back to, to your brain. And uh, it is also, also a fact of, of some spiritual uh, initiation by pure, very abstract vibe, not even a tune. It's just like a, to produce a sound as itself. Well, how you can, for example, uh, try to, to experience it, it, this is uh, when you try to tune your voice with the bass of, of uh, a bit broken neon, neon tube. Then you experience really the, the uh, similar effect as, 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 as Mongolians do. It's changing, it's changing. It's more like you, you are trying to, to push it as, as low as, as possible and then also to open it as, as, as robust. So it's not, not that much about like going back and, and there, it's more like going deeper and, and to sides, you know, etc. So I would have a very, uh, just um, a very um, practical question to Christian. Um, just in terms of <laughs> the preparation of the project here uh, with yes. Rosas, how realistic would it be to organize an ayahuasca seminar here in Loput <laughs> under, uh, you know? Uh, no problem at all. Just it give me the money, I get the shamans and the plants okay. and everything is here. Francesca, what do you think? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> when do you have time to come back? <laughs> <laughs> Next week. Next week? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have a, I have an ayahuasca uh, question. Is that uh, from what you were saying earlier, and from what I've seen on uh, documentaries and so on, yeah. there's a durational element in the sense that it, it can it lasts a good period of time. Ayahuasca and lasts yes. for four hours. Okay, and so uh, that's quite a period in in a, in a sense. Uh, and the, the the reason I'm asking the question is that. Uh, you, you stated clearly earlier that it contains DMT. And DMT in, in the UK was uh, fondly called businessman's acid uh, a few yeah, years ago, more <laughs> recently, because uh, obviously the city boys, the brokers, they would go to the toilets when they were at work in the UBS bank or wherever the hell they're working, and they go into the toilet, they have a quick pipe of DMT, and then they, oh, they're out. <laughs> They're there for 15 minutes and it's it's over. Yeah. And DMT stops working so rapidly in your brain. I think. I mean, when you come down, it's no, no, it's no. off. No, no, no. But no, it no. still continues to work at the same time. You don't, the, the 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 visual hallucinational element seems to stop. But then you continue to have this uh, smell uh, and other sensory experiences. Like everything smells like plastic bags for the next yeah. day. Uh, you know, if you go to the underground station, it's it's like you have this constant reminder of, of the DMT, but not the visual hallucination that you experience for, say, the 15 minutes. And so uh, I was just wondering about the difference of why, you know, DMT on its own, if you consume it, will last yeah. 10, 15 minutes yeah. and it's over, but it does continue in some way. It, uh, it, it really depends on uh, the way of administering it to you. Okay. Uh, the ayahuasca makes the DMT um, orally active, and that lasts, uh, fortunately, for four hours. Yeah. And uh, not only for five minutes. Uh, I, I don't think that everybody, uh, anybody ever had a 15-minute DMT flash. Uh, there's maybe a two-minute or three-minute uh, flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that's different. Is what I was yeah. yeah. So um, uh, if you use uh, the ayahuasca, uh, 
it, uh, it's not only the DMT effect uh, that lasts for four hours, but uh, there's also a cleansing effect of the drink in itself. So you have to puke like hell, and uh, it's, um, it may be very unpleasant if you take it for the first time. And uh, shamans, uh, I know, uh, used to say, after 50 times, you may know what ayahuasca is about. And uh, uh, the, my favorite shaman uh, is a Shipibo from the Shipibo people in uh, the Ucayali uh, area in uh, Peru. He uh, had taken ayahuasca six days a week for the past 30 years. He is, yeah, he, and, and he has not to puke anymore. <laughs> he, he, he all did all that. Yes, absolutely. And uh, um, what happens if Sunday stays? Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, maybe then they do some snuffs uh, which contain DMT too, but. Uh, no, uh, I was always puzzled. Uh, and, uh, people uh, say, well, the Native Americans, they know how to use drugs very well, and we don't know at all, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, if you stay in the Native community, they do drugs all the time. Yes. Always. It starts uh, with a morning tea, and uh, uh, you, you take some snuff that contains DMT, and uh, then uh, you drink a lot of chicha. Uh, this is a kind of alcoholic drink, and uh, all day. And in the evening, you take ayahuasca every day. So that's uh, the wise uh, way to do it. <laughs> yes, yes, it's, uh, there's uh, no differences in sex. <laughs> no, 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 you, wel you, you are very welcome to the ayahuasca world. <laughs> it's not exclusive. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask a question for Francois, but also a few of you others. Um, how do you uh, see the, the, the social construction around the garden? How do you envision that people will um, uh, participate or, or be uh, uh, exposed to the, to the, to the, to the garden? Because um, I think then when, when you talk about uh, ecstasy or uh, taking uh, drugs, it often has to do with the social, social, uh, social behavior, social constructions. Often uh, if you have a group of people like us, uh, at the beginning nothing really happens, but as soon as you drop a few drops of alcohol into the construction, then all of a sudden the, the kind of behav behaviorism changes. And I was also interested in hearing about the shamanistic uh, uh, constructions, how, uh, how, how important the kind of social, social uh, construction around these events is. And again, leading into Francois, how, how, how do you see uh, this construction around your garden, like the uh, social social behaviorism, or how, how you see people being being participants of it, or not being participants. And Carsten mentioned fear, for example, no, it, before. It, it's it's no, it's we don't want to suicide the project <laughs> before to construct it. So it's very important to, to take very careful. It not to, it's not to send a polemic or a provocative in, in the population, of course. So I think we, we, we have to start with a strategy of recovering the memory. First is recovering the memory, not talking about uh, recovering the memory of the monk, recovering the, the, a kind of tradition processing to modify natures or to use natures to do something. So we have, this is why the protocoli to protocolize it, we have to go very sweetly and slowly in the process if we want to do it, of course. But between you and me, uh, because here is a private joke, <laughs> a private game, a private talk, we could, of course, we could go further. We know between us we could go further and we could test and to test the practice on the boundary uh, with the machine, on the boundary of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the potential of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, starting gate, uh, of uh, opening gate to this other, other parallel universe. But to, to manage, if we want to produce the project, we, it's better, in my opinion, to talk about history, recovering, reactivating, recovering memory, than to talk directly about toxicity. And to, uh, so the toxicity is a collateral effect of the memory. 
uh, is not the main part of the project, uh, strategically, uh, to, 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 to f not to force, but to help people to understand slowly what could be the practice and how they could, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, apprivoiser, you know, apprivoiser, tame. Tame? tame, tame, how they could tame the project, like, uh, 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 comme le petit prince, like a little prince, the little prince with a, with a wild animal. So they have to, to, to apprivoise the project. And that can, can, cannot be done with a provocation. It has to be done in five, ten years, I think, if we do the project. I hope so. So we have, we, now, we, between you and me, we are developing the project about toxicity, and after we have to develop a strategy to do the project. But it's not exactly the same. Um, may I suggest something? First of all, we are in a monastery, and the monastery is the house of faith. This is the first and the base of everything. And Barbara told us that the pharmacy room was the first, the hospital was the second, and the church was the third. So the hospital was between, the hospital space was between the pharmacy room and the church. So between the pharmacy and the faith. And uh, combining this, all of us, the writing scenario for our lives, and uh, listening all these discussions today, <coughs> I had really great pleasure and honor to meet in Holiness Dalai Lama in Zagreb. And his peace in round, uh, around him and in him, it's uh, something what we have to think about that because we, <coughs> first of all, have to write of ourselves. And this Mediterranean garden is something really part of this monastery. This is the part of the history, part of the healing. But also the faith, it's also very important. And <coughs> my uh, humble suggestion that, that don't uh, separate that two things and really think about that uh, uh, social uh, view. And uh, combining these two things, the result will be much higher than just separate them. That's all. Thank you. All right, shall we leave it there? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.